Good afternoon, everyone. The Mill Park team, Gareth and I, would like to welcome you to this first in a series of webinars focusing on providing essential information to the firms regarding our Mill Park teaching and learning in the CA space. My name is Leanne Hayward. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer, and I'm very excited to share this session with all of you today. The purpose of today's session is to unpack the unique teaching and learning methodology through a discussion with two of our alumni who will share their experience, their experiences on how Mill Park was instrumental in, the, in their successful completion of their PGDA or CTA journey with Mill Park. Before I introduce the guests, I'd just like to introduce Mill Park very, very, very briefly. We've been in operation since 1997. We're accredited private provider of quality higher education. Together with my team, the corporate education team, we partner with organizations to co-curate and design learning journeys that meet your specific strategic learning needs. We have a number of schools, four to be exact, in Mill Park, the School of fin Financial Planning, uh, um, forgive me, the F School of Financial Services, which was launched just two weeks ago, which is which houses the qualifications, financial planning qualifications, investment qualifications, banking qualifications, and insurance qualifications. Mill Park Business School, which focuses on post-grad leadership and management development. Mill Park School of Commerce, which focuses on undergrad qualifications. And last but not least, the School of Professional Accounting, a great number of you on the call today are either students or alumni, and some of you are even representatives of firms who know CA Connect very well. The School of Professional Accounting incorporates CA Connect. Hanley will post in the chat, she will post links to the various um, pl places on the website where you'll be able to find more information. So I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'd like to take this opportunity to one introduce Gareth, Gareth Willifair, who is one of the founding members of CA Connect and now head of school of the School of Professional Accounting, and then the two ladies. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a bio and forgive me for reading it off because I really don't want to do any injustice to both these ladies. I'll start off, so in my top left-hand corner is Regina Witboy. Regina is a lecturer at the West Coast College in the Western Cape and is teaching accounting and mathematics, and she's been there for 10 years already. Regina has two degrees, a Bachelor of Education and a Bachelor of Accounting Sciences, both completed cum laude. Well done, Regina. In 2022, she successfully completed her postgraduate diploma in accounting through Mill Park while working full time and raising three children. Regina's future goal is to become a chartered accountant. She's not only determined to work hard and achieve her dream, she also hopes to inspire others to reach their first full potential and pursue their passions, just as she has. The ITC results are being released by SACA on Friday, and Regina is waiting excitedly for her, or her results. All of the best, Regina. Thank you. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Renee Moritz, also an alumni, a Mill Park alumni. Renee graduated with a, oy, gosh, with a bachelor's in accounting and a bachelor's of law, the University of Stellenbosch, where after she completed her practical legal training through the Law Society of South Africa. In, mid, in 2022, the mid-year intake, Renee embarked on her CTA with Mill Park. In 2021, after completion, Hang on, that sounds 2021. You, could, I've got my I dates started wrong, in, right? Yeah, 2020 and completed 20, in 2021. Correct. <laughs> I've got it wrong. My apologies. In 2021, <laughs> after completing the PGDA, top of her class, she went on to successfully complete the Psycho ITC as the national top achiever in September 2021. She passed her second board exam examination in the journey towards CA in December 2022, and she's currently in her final year of psycho audit articles at Mazars. Renee has a passion for learning and innovation and assisting her peers where she can to successfully complete their journey to becoming a CA. Thank you both ladies. Over to you, Gareth. 
Thanks, Leanne. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joining um, yeah, the webinar this afternoon um, evening. I think it's great to have um, this, this discussion in this webinar, I think, um, and, and especially I think given that it's targeted primarily in this in this instance more um, at, at everyone who's not, not specifically students. Um, we've run quite a lot of webinars directed at students in the past, but I think um, it's just an opportunity this afternoon just to talk specifically to um, those who are in corporates uh, or, or representing corporates and thinking about kind of pathways for students um, who are either on the path to, to being CAs um, or during their training contract um, or some of them even, even um, subsequent to their training contracts. And just talking a little bit about um, two um, yeah, firms and I suppose uh, corporates in, in South Africa just about the offering that Mill Park um, has. Um, and I think the interrelationship of study um, and, and, and work. And I think um, this is something strategically that has become important to us, us recently. I think um, traditionally Mill Park, interestingly, um, has focused quite strongly on the, on the corporates. Um, but for example, CA Connect, and we've, we've, we've merged with Mill Park in 2019. And so now it's kind of one thing of, of CA Connect kind of uh, incorporated into, into Mill Park. But CA Connect has always been quite um, almost just traditional in terms of the fact that we've we've dealt quite specifically with students like a traditional university um, would. But I think um, in some ways, strategically, what, what this webinar represents is us recognizing, I suppose, the critically important aspect that a firm plays in students' journey. Um, and I suppose educational institutions are always famous for saying, well, we can't teach students um, and, and, and bringing up, I suppose, the aspect of, of kind of the partnership or, or between almost the educational institution plus the commitment of the student um, and, and kind of the, the success being based on um, the degree to which the institution is able to collaborate with a student. But I think oftentimes there's not enough recognition given to the role that, that the firm plays um, in that journey. And I think the more we acknowledge almost that three-way relationship of the educational institution, um, the student as well as the firm, if we can get that kind of three-way relationship right, um, or, or at least improve it significantly, I think we can take significant steps um, to that. So, so that's, we, 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 I think, quite shortly, we'll enter into a conversation with Regina and um, Renee just about their journey on this. And I think we specifically um, asked them to be part of this panel discussion. I think because of the fact that when, as they went through the PGDA, um, they were working at the same time as, as um, studying. And I think hopefully this conversation just um, is almost step one of um, just, just talking about um, the offering that, 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 that Mill Park um, has, um, our relationship together with students plus firms um, and, and, and how this can work. And I think one of the things that's really important, um, I think for Mill Park uh, going forward is not to just be that educational high institution that says, um, this is what we offer, take it or leave it. I don't think that's the future of um, education. We're looking to have important relationships uh, with firms in terms of um, conversations, getting feedback um, in terms of how our programs fit into um, students' lives, into firms' lives. Um, we'll, we'll go through in the, in this, in the discussion uh, things like our beginning of the year intake, our mid-year intake, our half workload, our full workload, um, and, and a, a bunch of other initiatives that we have. Um, but a lot of, I think, the DNA of what we offer is an acknowledgement of this is not about us as Millpark. Um, this is about an industry um, that needs to think differently about the future of CA education. Um, and that's not by providing one size fits all solutions. Um, this is about providing solutions that fit with the multitude of um, requirements in people's lives today. Um, the working world changing, the, I don't know, the living world changing, um, just the nature of our lives is, is changing. And I suppose asking ultimately those deeper questions with the role that education plays in that. Um, so we're not gonna be exhaustive. We've, we've only got kind of um, an hour this evening and, and my experience is the time flies in these, um, but I'd ask you almost as as um, as attendees to this, please feel free to, to drop questions um, in the ask a question section um, at the bottom. We've got um, a number of our staff on that and they, they can answer a number of those, those questions. Um, but really in terms of the discussion, I'm gonna kind of in a lot of ways, throw it open to Renee and, and, and Regina to talk about their um, experiences um, in this. Um, I suppose what I'm hoping as a result of this, this webinar is, is we take step one 
um, into this conversation between Moog Park and firms and students and think about kind of this three-way relationship and how we make it um, work. And I think um, Leanne and her team is, is such an important part of this because strategically they set up um, as almost these um, people to manage um, and, and be dedicated to um, firms in, in the space because we I think we understand how um, important that relationship is. So part of this webinar is also an invitation um, to reach out to, to um, Leanne's team as a process of getting to know you better and understanding firms better in terms of needs um, so that ultimately in the education program we can offer um, things that, 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 that are better. That's things that I think Leanne's team already does with a number of really big corporates. I don't think I'm allowed to say the names, um, but, but a number of big corporates are, are already um, are, are kind of a core competence um, and something that, that historically Millpark has um, done quite well, not in the CA space, um, but I think this is kind of that, that, that step into to that space. So really the invitation to firms to say, let's, let's chat about how this works um, and, and tailor programs that aren't us dictating to you, um, but saying like, how does this genuinely work um, for the future of the CA industry? How do we cross collaborate and genuinely form working partnerships um, that are to, to the benefit of, um, of, yeah, of everyone? Um, and we were kind of brainstorming in terms, in terms of this, this webinar, what was the best way? And obviously my first proposal was let's do death by PowerPoint. Um, Leanne <laughs> said that that wasn't okay. Um, <laughs> So, so where we got to, as you as you can kind of see, is we're just gonna we, we're really just gonna have a discussion and and talk through some of the key aspects of the program, uh, but not through death by PowerPoint, through just um, chatting, I suppose, to Regina and um, Renee just about their experience in the PGDA, um, how they made decisions about the flexibility um, that 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 it, that it offers, um, and so it's going to be relatively informal, as you can see. Leanne is far too formally dressed for this, but I'm. Um, quite quite relaxed. I'll definitely say I'm an R a few times, um, but I, I hope from the conversation you, you just get the sense of um, this program, I suppose, really being a partnership. I think I've, I've never liked the idea that that education should be that, this formal authoritative thing where a lecturer points their finger and says, this is what you do or else. Uh, we, we view the education process as a, as a partnership, as a collaboration, um, and, and really a, an, an opportunity for us to say, well, I mean, a, a key thing we always are saying to students is um, we're not against you. Um, like we want you to succeed, pass PGDA, pass ITC, become CAs as much as you do. Um, and I think oftentimes it's the sometimes the, the mistake that educational institutions make that they set up these relationships in a way that for some reason there's there, there isn't that partnership relationship where it is the lecturers against the students. And I think uh, we we really try to get on the ground by by wearing our golf shirts and. Um, talking naturally to say to students, we're in this with you and we, we want to partner. And I think the same goes um, from, from a firm perspective. So yeah, sit back and relax, ask some questions, and I hope you enjoy enjoy the discussion. Um, Renee, Regina, I'm going to bring you in at this point because everyone's sick of hearing from, from, from me. I think one of the challenges I've always had, I mean, since, and since we started in 2019 with this program and CA Connect existed since, since 2010, um, but, but a challenge is, has always been like, how do you describe this thing of online education? Um, and it's, it's useful almost in this discussion that Renee, you from um, a contact education background, um, doing, doing a Stellenbosch undergrad, um, and, and Regina, you from a distance um, distance learning undergrad, um, being at UNISA. And um, so I suppose almost the first question to you guys is when you when you you obviously didn't do your undergrad at at Park. We subsequently have started our, our BCom in accounting, but but you guys obviously didn't study undergrad at Mill Park, and so there was almost this transition in terms of your from your undergrad into to the postgrad. Um, and yeah, maybe that's sort of the question to you guys. How did how did that feel just as a starting point um, in in that transition? Um, like I guess your expectations of of online education versus reality. Um, how how did you just navigate that 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 jump? And how did that that feel to you coming into this new I don't know online environment? Don't know who wants to. Take it first, Renee. You're looking pretty excited there. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I mean, obviously, coming uh, from like a contact university, you do think: uh, Is it going to be lonely? Um, am I going to have the same support system? You know, going to class, having the entire class there, um, and I, I went in without expectation, but a little bit nervous and. I mean, the way Mill Park is structured, they, you never feel alone. I mean, uh, through uh, classes on a, on a weekly basis, through multiple uh, ways students can connect with the availability of lecturers. So I think that was actually 
not a jump for me. Like I, I felt it was a community, a community that supported you. And I, uh, that is so important when you're studying. So whether that comes in the form of a contact university, we're in a class or whether it's an online um, studying method, if you have that community that supports you, that's, that's really all you need. So for me, um, Gareth, that was, I, I mean, a great, a great transition. And I think Mobile has spent a lot of time and energy ensuring that students do have a community and that they do not feel alone while <laughs> studying through a laptop and only communicating through Teams and so forth. You, you don't feel alone whatsoever. Mm. So do you know anything you want to add? <laughs> Yes, I Virginia? also just want, yes, thank you, Gareth, and thank, thank you, Leanne, for this opportunity. But I just want to add also, coming from UNISA, where I did distant learning, um, I was used to, like, being on my own, studying, doing, going through the tutorials, etc. cetera. So um, when I decided to do my PGDA, I was looking for the support and I was looking for that community where you feel included, where you feel like uh, people have your interest at heart. So I did a bit of research on um, Mopark and at that time it was CA Connect. I was reading about it and the testimonies that students were given were given and I was so excited about the positive feedback. And I also even watched a video where Gareth was uh, uh, talking about uh, what the uh, PGDA entails, what how much it costs and there was also students on that platform explaining their experience and what they have experienced. So I was really hooked and I was like, wow, this is really where I want to be because I don't want to be alone anymore. I don't want to just sit with my books and try to figure out things on my own. So then I enrolled for a PGDA and wow, wow, wow. From the first impression that the the, the uh, registration the process went fluent everything was um very effective and efficiently communicated the platform was de designed in such a way that you could actually follow what they want to achieve and i was just so hooked i read through all the things where to get the support the communities where to click for this and that i spent like i don't know the first four hours just reading because i was amazed by how well it was structured and what was what they were offering so yeah, I didn't feel alone at all. The jump was a bit, uh, not big, but in terms of support, it was totally different and it was just something that I needed. So I would say um, in terms of the jump, yes, I needed to adapt, but it was a good adaptation because it was so positive and it was so um, encouraging. And if you don't know, someone will reach out to you and assist you. So I really liked that from the get go and that kept me going and that kept me excited because I was no longer alone. There was a community out there waiting for you to reach out for them to support you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. And uh, yeah, it's it's nice to kind of delve into that just a little more more deeply, and uh, without going into, I suppose, the 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 deep educational theory on this. I suppose the two aspects to any online program is almost we, we often talk about a, a synchronous aspect of the course and an asynchronous aspect. And the synchronous is just the live stuff, kind of like this. This is synchronous. We can respond in real time. Um, and then there's also the asynchronous. Um, and I think often, and, and asynchronous as well, it's a document, you can read it anytime you want. It's a YouTube video, you can watch it anytime you want. Um, and I think oftentimes we, we we think about kind of online or distance as kind of a purely asynchronous model in terms of, I don't know, here's your notes, here's your videos, just kind of go off and, and, and watch it. And I think um, in the design of the program, and I think this is where it goes a little bit back into the history of CA Connect from, from 2010, our, our background was always very much in contact education. We came from a a UCT background, um, a lot of the, the founders, um, we then pivoted kind of into, uh, we helped UWC with their accreditation. Uh, we worked with Monash for a few years in terms of um, them becoming the first uh, private accredited uh, CTA in the country and then kind of found our, our home ultimately in, in, in Millpark. But long story short, I think the key for us in the design of the uh, PGDA was almost the combination of those two aspects with creating almost the, you've got to have the flexibility from the asynchronous material. I think Regina, I was reading your um, bio and you were saying how you woke up at two in the morning and that was kind of your life. And uh, Renee, we'll, we'll get into it later. I'm sure you had your other tricks and things of, of the schedules you needed. But the reality is whether you're working, whether you're studying full-time, whether you've got, uh, I don't know, a professional sports person or whatever your circumstance, people have different lives. And so the asynchronous material is, is a key aspect of that just in terms of adapting to flexibility. But then there's also the synchronous material that uh, for, I suppose, CA Connect and the development of the CTA was always so important because that represented the community, that represented the relationships, that represented almost the social momentum that is required to help build 
uh, or I suppose to those aspects that you, you guys speak about in terms of not feeling alone, um, in terms of that feeling like you have a campus with other um, students where you actually get to know your, your, your lecturers, where you can form study groups, where you can genuinely have relationships, because I think um, always what was kind of key to me kind of in the design and development of the program was this aspect that um, the hard stuff about CTA is not the technical stuff. Um, it's not um, the nuts and bolts and the numbers. It's like, it's a, it's a really hard process and in hard processes, you need relational support and you need um, great mechanisms in your life that, that lead you to, to success. So again, I'm being long-winded here and I need to get back to, to Regina and Renee, but maybe on, at a slightly more granular level, you guys can describe, Renee, you used the word community. Like, can, can you, I suppose, be more specific in terms of how you felt that community kind of in an online space like like what was it that made you I guess feel not alone and, and well, I think from the get-go, um, uh, yeah, we were prompted or there was a, a space created for students to um, interact with each other and to create groups and to form groups. Um, and whether they were in Johannesburg, Durban or Cape Town, we could all um, form groups together and had like a smaller um, support system in, in that way. But then also like on a weekly basis, if you were able to attend the live online classes, there were live online classes with, with lecturers where a lot of fellow students were and um, could chat, ask your questions after you worked through the material. And then also just um, actually the lecturers and, and being able to contact lecturers at some times, <laughs> setting up meetings quite late in the evening and, and them supporting you, not only on the technical level and the technical questions you have, but sometimes when you're feeling overwhelmed, giving that support yeah. as well. So I think it's your, your fellow peers and the lecturers that, that created that community for me. Awesome. And Regina, from your side? I would say for me, it was from the start, um, when we started with the PGDA, it was, I think, around about February, it was an intake. And then part of the uh, activity was that you need to introduce yourself on a platform. I think it was Yema, where you need to write about, hi, my name is Regina. I have three kids and I did this in my past and I'm hoping to achieve this for this year. So that was quite nice for me because it created almost like introduce yourself where you learn to 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 know other people maybe with similar situations and you could reach out to them so that was one thing that stood out for me in terms of knowing who is uh, the the other fellow um, peers that are also studying at, at Mill Park and then there was also the other services that uh, Mill Park provided the drop-in sessions on a Friday where you can just come together as students it's not content related it's all about about sharing maybe tips or maybe if you're frustrated or you're going through things, you just uh, go to the drop-in session. Terry would be there. That, well, that was our almost like the, the person that was um, running the drop-in sessions. So then we'd, we would just talk about normal things, about tips, about how was your week. Some of us struggling to study mental, less mental, maybe mental issues, struggling with things. So that community also helped to re for me to realize that I'm not alone. There are people going through the same things and I could also take tips from them. And then there was also Yammer where you can post a question and sometimes um, students would post a joke here and there just to keep the morale up. So it was not only all about um, education. It was like at the university where you get together and you have your different cliques. Some are doing this and others are doing that. So you find something that you feel like this is feeding me and this is supporting me on my journey. So there were many options that you can actually choose from and belong to. And for me, that's um, a, a mother of three and I'm very busy during the day and sometimes you get so overwhelmed or um, because of the education or the pace that the program is set at but you can still reach out um, there's communities for that and we also had the option where you can reach out to a study buddy or accountability partner they encourage that I did that and I'm so thankful for that because I'm, I, I managed to get someone that walked with me during this journey we had our great um, share of challenges and laughter. So it is really quite nice the way that they created the different options and services available where you feel like I belong, I can 
take this and go with it on my journey to make a success of it. Mm. So I made use of all those things just to see which one works best for me. And sometimes I will just mix it up, a drop in session, one on one uh, consultation or a post in Yema or just reach out to my accountability partner. So there was a mix of things that made me feel like I belong. I can make it. And um, if I keep on just doing what I'm doing and reaching out when needed, then I can make a success of this journey. Yeah, thanks, Regina. And just to, to fill in uh, possibly one of the bl uh, blanks for, for everyone out there in terms of you mentioned Terry and the drop in sessions. Um, just as background to that, um, a number of our staff in the, um, in the School of Professional Accounting aren't um, CA staff. We've, we've obviously got. Um, quite a, the majority, I suppose, are, are CA staff, but we also have um, psychologists and counselors specifically, um, not just kind of at an institutional level, but involved in the day-to-day -day, um, of the running of the PGDA and bridging and, and, and BCom. Um, I suppose also just on that, on that understanding of the nature of the program that um, the challenges we face are to a large extent, not technical or not the CA stuff. It's not the IFRS and the tax queries. It's it's about the community. It's about the motivation. It's about the momentum. It's about, um, yeah, staying up to date and and feeling part of a community. And if we can kind of conquer that, then a lot of the the, the teaching and the learning aspects um, can be made a lot easier. Um, and 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 so that's yeah, that's quite an important part of kind of the ethos of what we do. Is it not kind of like let's get IFRS right? It's it's more along the lines of kind of can we get the community and relationship aspects right, and then hopefully um, a bunch of the other stuff takes takes care of itself. And I think. Also to your point, Regina, around almost we refer to it sometimes as the buffet of, of yeah. support because we, I suppose we know it at different times we have different needs in terms of sometimes you need asynchronous support with an email or a Yammer post. Um, sometimes you need kind of the synchronous stuff with a one on one session. Um, sometimes you need a group live session. Um, and I suppose we try to offer that, that buffet of support, not um, as a prescriptive method to say, well, you must use everything every week, but to say it and to understand that different people have different needs and a different times of the course there are different pressure points um, and there are those that fail those mechanisms of support to use as and when it's appropriate for, for for you and to kind of walk that partnering path down the journey with with um the class to to figure out um yeah just what what's appropriate for them at each time and kind of how we can walk the difficult journey journey together something that's fascinating about about you guys and probably particularly for the context of this um you are both uh working and studying um, at the same time. And Regina, I think you've um, said, mentioned you've got three kids as well, which I can only imagine what, what, what that is. But, but even more interesting is that you, even though in the PGDA, we've got the option of the half workload and full workload, you guys both chose the full, the full workload. Um, so just in terms of the background of it, the full workload, our general guidance is that requires 40 hours a week um, of work from a student perspective. It is 40 pretty flexible hours. So probably about 90% of those hours are flexible and, and asynchronous, um, but it's still 40 hours. So flexible doesn't mean, um, uh, doesn't mean less. It, it just means, well, there's 40 hours, but you can, you've got the choice of when to do it. Um, and then, but then of course we realize that based on life circumstances, which could be work, which could be other things, uh, many students can only put in 20 hours. And that's where we kind of have our half workload. Um, kind of the, the details of that, is up on the on the website if anyone wants to kind of read about it. But we try to make it almost as cost agnostic as possible in terms of there's no cost difference between the half workload and full workload. So we can hopefully empower um, students and and firms who are helping students make the decision, um, empower them to make this, the the decision that's in their best interests. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask uh, you guys and and Renee, maybe we can start with you in terms of um, that choice to do the full workload and both just how. They that. Maybe I didn't know what I was getting myself into at the point when I started, because I, I, I started my first year of, of articles. So, you know, I, I just <laughs> took the 40 hours. I think, I mean, you have to be committed when you do the 40 hour program and you have to be honest with yourself. The thing I liked about, about Millbrook is obviously the flexibility, but also there's enough structure to early on communicate with whether it's your managers or, or HR, whoever does your you're plotting, you can work around busy season, know how to, um, especially when you're writing tests and so forth, structure and communicate early on that. And then like from a personal level, like so your time, 40 hours is a lot. Uh, um, like you mentioned, the, the 20 hours, 20 hours, uh, if I maybe now in my life or if I post articles, it might 
rather be the 20 hours because you really have to be honest with yourself and you if you can put 40 hours in sometimes i i was doing i was doing 30 hours i'm not gonna lie and i had to like catch up a little bit but yeah mine was 7 to 11 every evening and 20 hours during the weekend um but also being adaptable and flexible during that if i over time was required to switch it around a little bit um but yeah so i i think uh, the 40 hours is it's doable um depending on on what your life looks like and uh what your work looks like and what your work requires from you um but i think it's important amazing to also have the option of doing 20 hours because doing 40 hours 20 hours i could see 20 hours is very feasible 40 hours is so feasible yeah but a little bit more difficult and i think that's where from a terminology point of view we've been quite deliberate about not calling this full-time and part-time uh we, we specifically about calling it full and half workload because it's it's really about providing the option and not the the prescription so Kind of as kind of Rene and Regina kind of are saying, they were working, but they still chose the full workload. Where I think a lot of times in the past we thought, oh, uh, full workload equals full time. And I think that's where we, I suppose, as an institution, we say, well, let's chat and have a conversation. But ultimately, each person is the expert on their life. Um, so we can provide the options, but then they must, uh, I suppose, it's up to each individual. Um, and probably with the counseling, I, I, I would expect from the firm as well. Um, to say what what is the option that's best suited for you um and probably something that that um worth worth as as firms thinking about is what what is appropriate what is your view i guess on on the workload that the students take because i'd imagine there could be some firms where this work works on a on a kind of full workload basis but some firms will just say oh we've got x and y clients and um it, it's just not going to to make sense regina i'm a bit worried about coming to you because I know on top of the work requirements, you also had three kids. So I sort of don't want to ask how you actually put it in, but maybe you can tell us your experience on, on the full workload and kind of how that felt for you. Okay. So before I decided to do the full workload, I first uh, planned because um, for me, it's very important to plan. So I looked at the time that I had available, uh, luckily, or if I can put it that way, um, luckily for me, I was a lecturer. So I looked at, um, my holidays and I planned it way in advance. Like I can use my holidays. I can use my free time that I have available to just uh, focus on studying. So I was working out and scratching out so many times, having different plans. Okay, this is how I'm going to do it. This is each and every time. Do you know, then I would doubt myself and ask myself, will it be possible to get like 40 hours on top of what you're already doing? So I was consistently replanning. And then I spoke to my husband. We work out a plan like, okay, I'm willing to commit and sacrifice this year. I was used to waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning. So I will just continue waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning and just continue with that and commit my holidays, commit uh, social functions, commit all the other things. Just give it up for a year and try to slot in some of them here in there and to see whether it's possible. So then when I actually um, started drafting that plan, it looks doable. So then I said to myself, OK, I'm going to try and do this and try to stick to this plan 80 or 90 percent of the time. And I um, decided, OK, let me do the full workload and see how it goes, uh, because already on paper it was looking like it's doable. So now I just need to to play my part and to implement it and then it will work. And the other thing also was um, the age. It wasn't really the main reason, but it was also a reason like, OK, I'm not getting younger, so I need to, to think in terms of finishing this thing and then just moving on. Mm -hmm. So um, because of what I've read and what I already experienced about a mill park, I said to myself, this is the place that I, where I want to be because I could mold my times around the, um, uh, the way the, the program is structured and I could work around that. It's flexible. You can study anywhere, anytime, as long as you have um, internet connectivity and as long as you are committed, you are able to do this. So from the get-go, I committed 2 a.m. waking up, studying till 5, 5.30, sometimes 6 o'clock. And then I would prepare myself, prepare the kids. Uh, my husband knew that some weekends I won't be available. My phone would be switched off. Um, I would just be focused on doing this thing. So I've missed out on a lot of things, but I was willing to pay the price because I knew if I, I'm able to pay the price for this one year, then I will reap the rewards at the end. So there were so many sacrifices, but I'm so glad that I did that and I committed to that, say 80 or 90% of the time, because today I'm standing on the other side and I'm feeling like, thank you for committing to your plan. So it was also made possible uh, 
due to the quality service that I received, the support throughout. So Mill Park was really one of the reasons that my plan worked so well, because the content, the quality, the lecturers, the community, everything was just working so nicely together. And it was just me that needed to play my part to make a success of this. So doing that actually uh, enabled me to complete the degree at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting points you guys make because I think it's it's clear from the way both of you guys speak, you're both extremely conscientious in, in your studies. And I think you're an example, I guess, of with that conscientiousness, how I suppose the full workload is doable mm -hmm. with with work commitments and, and family commitments. But I guess not all uh, students are like that. And I, th I think that's kind of the point where it, the, the half workload is a viable option for for many people just kind of knowing their life knowing their personality type and kind of i suppose what we often try to do is almost have that counseling conversation with with students about choosing the appropriate mechanism for them um and, and making that mature choice because it is appealing i suppose to do the program over one year um but if you know objectively you can't do 40 hours then that's not gonna gonna work for you so it's important to to understand um yeah to to understand that and i think from a design perspective i think as i've said the like obviously the half workload takes longer so the option would be well if you're going to do 20 hours a week then it takes two years if you do 40 hours a week it takes takes one year but the, the cost is still the same cost spread over um a, a different um yeah a different period um regina you made the, the comment almost about kind of leave and how you're able to use that effectively uh renee i'm interested to hear about you and how you because i think also but we often get the question from firms um, about kind of leave policies. Um, and I think oftentimes firms, especially have students who work and study at the same time, have kind of had specific um, uh, leave policies often tailored to, to the UNISA CTA. How, what, what role did, did and, and, and I think our schedule is quite different to that. So the role that kind of leave played in, in your study schedule and how you were able to work with your firm and getting the appropriate leave and how important that was. What, what was your experience there? Yeah, well, I, I think I didn't mind like two, three years back, my, my CTA, and I think I was one of the first people that now completed the, the course. So I was lucky to work with HR to like get get the leave to, to match um, to match Millpark's schedule and so forth. They went on the same almost structure about like how many leave days they will give the UNISA students. So it's not like the, the days changed. It was just how it was spread out. Um, I got a, a nice amount of study leave, um, which I, I don't know how most firms work, but up between 20 to 25 days, it helped tremendously. Um, I know at, at our firm, we can decide how we structure our leave. So my decision was to, for the tests only take the days that I write and to keep my leave up until finals um, to have that preparation for finals. But I, I think um, having flexibility in the way that you do structure your leave is quite nice. So having a, a certain amount of days and then yeah, um, getting to structure that for your needs, for your flexibility, because you know where you are before a test or where you are before mm -hmm. the exams. And then obviously if you're lucky enough to work at a firm that, that has you take annual leave with your study leave, or if you can work with that over time to get um, uh, additional leave, um, that has also helped. So that was my approach to, to get as much leave for the finals. And yeah, during the year, I was just mm -hmm. doing those 40 hours and, and like Regina, also say sacrificing but i think both of us could say we we don't regret any sacrifice we made when when we got those results <laughs> i think it's an interesting one the the leave one because it's, i think it's a conversation we have quite a lot with with students and and firms is around kind of what's the appropriate leave policy um and i think a key thing i suppose that i, I think you guys would agree with was almost leave is not something that you can rely on as your mechanism of study i mean you, you've got to find a rhythm to life whether you choose kind of 20 hours a week or 40 hours a week you've got to find a rhythm to life where you're not relying on on leave that it gets interwoven into that so leave can be hugely valuable like kind of renee in your example if you can just pile it up for final exam i think from a consolidation and revision perspective that's hugely valuable but the you know in a lot of ways the the, the hard work gets done during the program um okay. i often say to students like if you could just study before the the test or exam then we'd made make the cta one month man um course because you've worked over a year not because you've worked over a month um and yeah and that's that's and, and and i think also to the to the workloads i think um 
another important aspect of the, the half workload and the full workload um, is, and it being a student choice, is that um, structurings in other institutions have often been to an academic requirement, determining whether you can do something over one year or two years. And I think we, we've tried to turn that on its head and say, there's absolutely zero shame in doing the half workload because this is not an academic thing. This is a, this is a life thing. And that's why this must be a student choice, not a, not a Millpock institution choice. Um, and, and I think we've seen some incredibly successful students, some of our top PGDA students being the ones who can make the mature decision for their life of opting for the half workload, even though of course they could do the full workload, every student has the option to do it, but, but tailoring it to their life and then that really leveraging their, their competence. And I think we've, we've developed hopefully kind of a nice ethos in the program that there's actually a lot of pride in doing the half workload and saying like, this is what's right for my life um, and, and seeing great results. Because I suppose what you never want to do is take the full workload um, and then you don't make it and then you pay for the full workload and kind of you could have just slowed it down. Um, and then you have students who repeating two or three times when if you just took it in kind of smaller bite sized chunks that was more tailored to their life, then, then they'd be better set up for, for success. Um, yeah, in that regard. Um, a couple more questions, um, guys, because I want to hopefully leave 10 to 15 minutes um, at the end for, for um, some questions. But I suppose just also interestingly, um, another aspect that I think probably academic programs do badly is that it, they, they can tend to be these things that operate in isolation of the world. And it's just like academic programs. And then there's the real world somewhere in the distance over there. Um, so I'm interested in your experience on, especially as people who were kind of working and studying at the same time, the impact that the program had on your work um, and the degree to which you you guys saw that um, coming through. Regina, you might be a little bit different because I think you were in a almost a teaching a, yeah. a teaching environment. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Renee, in terms of kind of the, the audit world that you were in and kind of the interrelationships you saw between the academic program and, and your work. Yeah, well, I mean, from a technical side, just what I was learning in my CTA, there was a, a, a lot of interaction. I um, definitely, on my technical knowledge, I was uh, able to sharpen up and use that in, in, on a daily basis. Um, yeah, then with with the studying, I think an audit environment is quite nice for studying because uh, you have so many people around you that's also studying. Um, but audit is, is a, yeah, if there's a auditors in the audience they'll know uh, overtime is required we have busy season um and the flexibility of mill park and the support system and the understanding and how the program is structured to yeah is a fit with individuals that are working or that have busy lives really really helped a lot there was times that uh, hectic overtime where you were working 80 hours plus a week when you just didn't have the time to study but the program is of such a nature that you can catch up you have access to this information you have access to lecturers that will assist you so so i do think that uh, the program is structured in a way to to be mindful and to uh, help uh, individuals that are working and also the people employed at Mill Park. And I know that not all the lectures are there, are there anymore than what was two years back, but everybody was was mindful and and wanted you to succeed and you know was just realistic with what one's life looks like. That we're not just mm. studying twenty four seven. Mm. That I wish we could, but uh, but we couldn't. Everybody. Yeah, just worked with you to ensure that you can really complete this program and and do it the best of your abilities. And Regina, from your side, I would say um, the value that this program has added to my life in terms of my work as well as my personal life. There's so many. Um, uh, how can I say value that has been added? Because instead of just looking at um, the financial implication, I've also learned in management accounting about looking at the non-financial implication, the cost versus the benefit when you make a decision. Even while I was studying, if someone asked you, um, can we do this this weekend or are you available this time? Then I needed to weigh up the cost versus the benefit. Those small things that contributed to making better decisions. So even at work, uh, uh, they have like, imprinted in me the control controllability aspect and the uncontrollable things so it helps you in terms of your decision making for your personal life and also at work i was able to say okay this is out of my control i cannot control this i can control this part let me focus on this so there is really those values that they impart in you during this course where you learn about um 
things that you are not aware of, decisions that will impact you in the long run. And all those things I tried to implement in my life because I've learned them and they were relevant where, where I was working as well as in our household. So that made me a b better person when it comes to decision making. I was able to see, oh, okay, I can see that the implication of that, even though it looks positive, what is the long term effect? And I can still hear my lecturers because JD and JP, they normally just this long term decision making and non financial factors and cost versus benefits. So those things were singing a song in my head each and every time that I'm encountered with a decision I looked, uh, I went back to those things and I could apply them. So yes, there's so many things that I learned throughout this course and I, I, I've learned um, to ask more questions, to focus on understanding, to know the why and to, to, to ask, ask is there a better way of doing this thing instead of working harder, work smarter, all those things that I just took for granted just was like fixed in my head. This is where you go to when you're dealing with something like that. So I would say it add, added tremendous value to my life up to date, up to this day still. Um, and those soft skills and those other things that um, sometimes we may look at it and think it's irrelevant for me, it was relevant because it also helped me in planning and sticking to my uh, timetable, sticking to my course and being positive because I was making decisions using those principles that I was taught mm -hmm. and that will benefit me in the long run. Because I remember JD or JP saying, we want to make good decisions. So what do you need to make good decisions? I use all those things to help me um, um, yeah, and that's that's certainly yeah. music to my ears, Richie, because it's, I mean, it's, it's things that we, I suppose, we hope for in the design of the program. So for you to articulate it in that way, to almost have that stuff that's almost the implicit stuff that, that becomes explicit um, is 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 great when you can actually take management, accounting, and finance and make it real and you know, what's a sunk cost and what's the relevant cost and like all, all that kind of things. I think the other aspect that I think employers have been feeding back to us a little bit is is in terms of almost the new or the adapted or evolving world of work um, and the need for students exiting um, higher education programs to be upskilled for that. I think another aspect where we try for our program to reflect life and the, the, the today's world of work is, is also in terms of the interaction of the tools that we use. And when we, when we use, I mean, the, the students are all on, on Microsoft Teams, when we on the, the learning management system, when we've got Yammer, which is a mirror for, for social media and that type of interaction that all, I suppose, the, I don't know, the traditional support mechanisms one would expect from a, almost a contact university with a community, with a campus and all that, we've, we've tried to, I suppose, reflect those in an online context where we get the same kind of feeling of community and support, um, but through these online tools. And I think hopefully through that, the graduates who leave us are able to then make a more seamless transition into a world of work, having operated their life. Um, in a lot of ways from an educational point of view that they can carry through to to work in a professional um, viewpoint. And I think that is something probably that um, the more traditional universities they grapple with in terms of that digital acumen um, and, and not just necessarily the explicit stuff of big data handling and um, kind of a bit of coding and that kind of thing. It's just being a person in a, in a digital world is a, is, a, is, a, is a difficult thing to to educate on. And I think Hopefully, that's another almost implicit thing that we see coming through in a in a in a way of leveraging kind of the the guys who come through. Um, Leanne, um, we chatted for quite a bit. Um, I've got the comments switched off because I'm a terrible multitasker, so I'm not seeing things that are coming through or questions. Um, anything that's coming up that you think would be helpful to to chat through? Um, so, Gareth, I think I just want to loop back into what Regina was talking about as a soft skills. I like to call them power skills rather than soft yeah. skills, Regina, because if if you've if you've acquired those, they're very very powerful rather than soft, right? Things like critical thinking, and if you look at the future fit skills that employers are looking for in graduates. I think the way the program is structured and the journey that you follow, you those sort of power skills are inculcated in the journey. So when you exit, mm. you are a well-rounded graduate that can hit the ground running and thinking differently and behaving differently to the traditional, the traditional sort of, um, you know, 
normal universities. I don't like to use the word normal because then it's like we abnormal. So I, I just really wanted to mention that. Gareth, thank you. There is a very, very important question that one of our, our participants or one of the people on the webinar has asked. And the person asks, hi team, I'm in an organization where the majority of learners are indicating an interest, an interest in attaining CASA are SEMA members. The pursuit is dual designation. I'm aware that SICA and SEMA have an agreement for members to access CASA in a shorter program. Does Millpark have an offer where SEMA members can be supported mm. for the APC? Yeah, thank exam? you. And that's an important one. Um, and I think this, I'll, I'll bring this back. I suppose what I'm going to start with talking about here is um, the, 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 okay, short answer is, is no, we don't, but, uh, but it's not yet. Um, I think what we're seeing, and we introduced our BCom accounting, um, and I think that is designed to have almost a, a CA stream and a professional accounting stream. And, and the idea there is to articulate into different pathways into SEMA, ACA, CIPA, um, AGA, um, all, all those qualifications. And then that's almost the, 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 the undergrad aspect of things. But then I think what this, this question comes into, which is, which is perfect, is, is almost the also the, the things that happen um, after the, the postgraduate, like, for example, the SEMA members articulating into the CA path um, via the um, writing part two um, of the board exam AP, APC. So we're almost looking at the, the undergrad aspect and we're looking at the post qualification aspects um, at board courses and that support into APC, because I know there is um, a gap in concern um, for, for a number of people who've kind of through the SEMA route, they qualify for um, uh, writing part two of the board exam, but they don't, they, they, they want to make sure they, they appropriately prepared. And so I, I suppose as part of those aspects, we're looking at that um, in, in the future, even though we don't kind of have it now. But I think the reason I suppose I bring the BCom in is, um, I don't know, a signal of the strategic um, need to, to do that. And I think it's also something where, um, Leanne, I think corporates also with specific needs, um, if this is also part of your team's mandate in terms of understanding those, um, and the better we can understand the needs for those, um, the, the more we can create these types of programs. Because I know Leanne works on a lot of co-creation um, with, with corporates for specific courses they need, um, for uh, whether it's bespoke or whether it's, it's, it's broader public um, ones that are available. But I think this is also part of our, our need and our desire to, to work with and understand corporates um, so that as this answer alludes to, we can, we can get an understanding and develop kind of um, these needs that are out there as a higher education institution that wants to be adaptable to to the needs of our, out there. Am I, am I right in what I'm saying, Lydia? Yes, very much so, Gareth. So we partner with organizations to uh, our partnership is twofold. One is to understand what industry requires so that that informs how we design and formulate our programs that we offer to Joe Public. But then on the other hand as well, we co-design and co-curate journeys that meet the strategic objectives in terms of learning and development for the organizations. So I think today is not really the day for us to discuss the, the in-depth way in which we partner with, with the organization, because I think we wanted to really illustrate what we can do in terms of, of the CA stream. But I think importantly is that, to, importantly for the firm representatives is to understand that my team and I partner with you by first understanding what your strategic objectives are, what the competencies and capabilities are that are required. And I'm talking a little bit broader beyond just the sort of CA stream across your organization to understand what the capabilities are that you require and then to solution together with you and build various journeys. To go to, to, gather, to Gareth's point, I seem to have lost my ability to articulate, um, to go to Gareth's point as well, is that the information that we receive from firms informs how we respond to the requirements of firms. So for example, with a, another firm, uh, we might be represented here, I can't see, where, where we are looking at post-qualification. So post the PGDA, what, what other skills and journeys are now required to broaden the, the offering that the individual then has offering into the organization. So that's how we like to really partner. It's not a 
off the shelf brown box solution, but to really work with you as as the firm or as the corporate South Africa corporate in South Africa to understand your needs and find appropriate solutions that work for you that may not necessarily work for another organization. Um, Gareth, I do think that just if I can go back to our, pre our discussions is perhaps we spoke about the full and the half load and we workload and we spoke about the two intakes and how that was super appropriate for the students. But perhaps if you can illustrate to us what the benefit is for the firms in mm. terms of those two critical um, mm. sort of methodologies that we use. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Leanne. It's an important point because we haven't really spoken about the, the the beginning of the year intake and the and the and the mid year intake. And it's and so I mean, very broadly speaking, students have an option every February to join a new PGDA intake and every July to join a new PGDA intake. Um, and likewise, our bridging program that's six months long. So basically, every February and every July, there's a new opportunity to start uh, bridging and PGDA, and also I, I would include in that the BCom as well. Um, now, I think. Oftentimes, what not everyone realizes is they imagine almost that they they almost mirror images of each other. So it's almost exactly the same if you do the February intake or the July intake. Um, and what's interesting, I mean, if you look at the holidays um, in the calendar year, obviously the December holiday is a big block of holidays that that exists in one part of the year but not the other. Um, and what it what it means, and I think Renee, I see you nodding a little bit here, is is what you, because I think you did the mid year intake in in July. For example, what it means is that um, the the study break, for example, before test three is a lot longer on the mid year intake versus the beginning of the year intake, and that's just a function of holidays and how how the world works, I suppose. Um, and it's it's definitely a, a worthwhile consideration. And I'd invite firms, if you're interested in this, to get hold of our, our schedules, and we can show you where tests and exams are, and, and we encourage students to do the same to look at study breaks. And both intakes are not the same, um, and and they provide different um, different benefits and um, configurations, depending on what's important in, in your life, because I think it's, it's not just a case of like, oh, I arrived at this juncture and let me start in February or let me start in, in, in July. It, it's worth looking at those. Um, and specifically, Leanne, also to your question around a consideration for firms is, of course, firms are cyclical um, in their work. Um, and that means that based on the structure of the, of, of the programs, it can make more sense for, for students to do a February or a July intake, which is why I would say, well, please, uh, the, the um, calendars or the schedules, for example, are on the CACNIC website and we can send you future ones as well. Um, but but take that into account. Um, and, I th and I know, Leanne, in terms of um, what you've done in terms of tailoring programs for some of the corporates as well, um, is knowing their schedules and cycles over a year, they've also asked for almost certain configurations of the program. And we, we operate within certain parameters. So there's certain things we can't break, but there's definitely things that we can offer. Um, and we can offer not a full block release system, but um, uh, strategic pauses um, in the program. Like if a firm says to us, yo, we've got like three months where it's just crazy with clients and our, our staff have to work crazy overtime, we can take that into account in some aspects and say, well, can this configuration work um, for a program? Can we tailor something in certain respects to, to you? And again, it comes back to almost, I suppose, the invitation of why this conversation is so important um, so that if and where appropriate, those are things we can and want to to build into the the design. Did that sort of answer the question, Leanne? I, I didn't speak about the the workloads no, as no. well. No, I think I think that answers the question. I think the workload we did we did kind of cover some of those the aspects of the workload there. Gareth, there is one more important question that I see we're running out of time, and and I have a few thank yous before we go as well. Is just how does my employer benefit from an employee being enrolled in the course. So in other words, what is my employee's selling point? What is my value proposition, if I could put it more in marketing terms? What is the, the employee's value proposition to the firm having, besides just having qualified as a CA, having gone through the journey with Mill Park? Hmm. I'm trying to think how, how I can answer that. And I'm wondering if I, if there's a way for me to put that question onto uh, Regina and Renee and, and kind of your experience of whether there's, I suppose, value. I, I suppose what I hope would be the answer would be, I, I hope you're a better CA. I hope you're more adaptable and able to um, adjust to, to the world of work and the demands that the, the firm places on you and you're more resilient, more adaptable and more innovative and willing to learn. Um, but Renee and Regina, tell me if I'm 
if I'm, I'm <laughs> not being objective no. in that. No, I definitely agree. Like the, uh, I think we all touch on the soft skills. You learn time management. I mean, in my industry and all that, time management. The quicker you can work and manage your time, uh, taking responsibility for for yourself and your own actions, and taking responsibility in work. And then obviously, if your firm wants you to become a CASA and you have Mulpark that is willing to work with firms to tailor it across busy season. If we're speaking about audit now and ensuring that trainees can actually successfully complete the course while working i mean that's a great selling point for your firm that they make you a better rounded individual both technically and your soft skills and then they are willing to work with your firm to ensure that they can get the maximum out of like when it's busy season and then you can con successfully complete your studies i think that's a great selling point <laughs> regina if you want to add anything yes. else I would agree with you, uh, Renee, because um, you learn the power skills, like Leanne said. Um, you learn good decision making. You learn how to think critically, how to look at the situation from different uh, viewpoints. And you also learn how to take something, take it apart and ask yourself, is there a better way of presenting that? So you will add value to the firm that has employed you by using the skills that you learn through the course, applying it on your day to day work and also improving like the value of the firm, your value that you bring to the table as well as just you as an individual being well-rounded because now you can um, use those skills in whatever you're doing at work. So I think in terms of the value that it will add to you as an individual as well as to the firm is that you learn those critical thinking skills as well as um, uh, looking at, like I said, at an uh, um, a situation from different viewpoints and you will learn to know and understand the why not just uh, doing the thing routinely you will learn to look at the thing and see okay is this the right way even though we have been doing it like that is there a better way is there a smarter way so all those things come into play by doing the pgda because automatically by doing that you will learn how to think in that way and then you can take it to your firm and then you can apply it on a daily basis Leanne, can I squeeze in? And thanks, Regina. That's, that's really valuable. Leanne, can I squeeze in one last point? But I know we we basically out of time. The the only thing we haven't spoken about in the session, and, and maybe hopefully this is, uh, I'm really hopeful that there'll maybe be an episode two of the, the webinar at, at, at some stage if this has been useful. But the one thing we haven't spoken about is the bridging program, and I think that represents something important as well because um, there's also this, and our bridging program is six months um, if you do it on the on the full workload. But I think. Also an opportunity there, and something to be aware of for students who don't specifically come from a CA background. We have a business background, but it's not necessarily CA, um, to, to kind of articulate relatively quickly and seamlessly into the CA um, stream. Um, and I think, again, looking to the kind of the world of work and adaptability and kind of, I think, bringing in diverse skills into the CA space, I think that represents something um, quite, quite important. It's, the bridging program isn't a conversion course, and conversion course is looking at something uh, another strategic priority for the future where we kind of take engineers and doctors and bring them into the CA world. So, so bridging is is not quite that. It's it's taking non-CA people and bringing them into the, 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 the CA path. But it also represents, I think, a, an important future strategic aspect of the program in terms of um, widening access um, and just um, improving the richness and diversity, I think, of, of the CA profession. And I think we've seen a lot of um, yeah, success from these students who traditionally wouldn't have been able to articulate into the the, the CA path who through the six month um, program can can access it in in that way rather than doing, for example, a full year of of undergrad um, repeated or a BCom from scratch. And it, it, it's 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 been quite useful from yeah from that point of view. But I think definitely good material for an ep episode two, Leanne. <laughs> Absolutely, Gareth. Thank you very much. I think what, what we do realize every time with, with these webinars is that an hour simply just isn't enough. But we don't want to keep people away from suicide hour with their three children. And I know people have had very busy days. I think just in, in wrapping up, I think, you know, we've, we've got a diverse group of people on the webinar. We've got some students, we've got some alumni, we've got people who are interested in studying with us. And importantly, we've got the representatives of the firm. So what Hanley has done is, as in the chat, she has posted links to the website. Um, Hanley is specifically as well, if you could chat, if you could post the, the link to the bridging, the bridging program so that if people are interested in it, they can go to there. And also by all means to the firm representatives, please reach out to my team and I. 
on the corporate training email address. We'll certainly set up dedicated time to discuss your specific requirements and needs, um, you know, around learning and development as a whole, not only specifically the in, in terms of, of the CA. Thanks very much, Hanley. And then I think if, if um, I don't know if there's final sort of comments from Regina and um, Renee, perhaps. Thank you for having me. And I just, yeah, I think uh, I can really say that uh, Molpark really changed the trajectory of my career. It learned me so, or taught me so much like valuable skills. And that's why I'll always, when, when Gareth calls or anybody calls, I'm more than willing to speak about Milpock and the amazing, amazing effect it had on both my life, my personal life and my career. So I'm, yeah, I'm definitely, <laughs> if you can study through Milpock, if you can do your CTA, I would advise it. But that's just my personal endorsement. Nobody paid me and it's my personal endorsement to say that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jenny. I also just want to say Okay, I just want to say thank you, Leanne, and thank you, Gareth, and the Mulpark team for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, I was a bit nervous, but yeah, the way that uh, the conversation went, it was ca quite calming and it wasn't so stressful. So I am thankful for the opportunity. I also want to say um, those that are maybe considering studying their PGDA through Mulpark, I would strongly advise, but like Rune say, we're not forcing you. We know the benefits that we, we got from Mulpark and the value that it has added to our lives. So if you are um, considering and thinking of uh, continuing or starting a PGDA, I would say Mulpark is the best because um, of what I actually got from them and the value that they imparted in my life. So thank you so much, Mulpark, Gareth, Leanne, Hanley, and all the team, uh, the other lecturers, um, of Malpak, you guys are doing an amazing job, like really, and um, I appreciate that. And the fact that I can be at home, use my own uh, uh, schedule, fit it into and mold it around the way that the PGDA is set up. So thank you for that. Thank you for the quality services that I have received throughout my year at, at Malpak um, CA Connect. And thank you for the hard work and the dedication and the inclusive, inclus inclusiveness and all those amazing stories and people's lives that you are changing and the CAs that you are really connecting, like the words say CA Connect. So thank you for that and continue doing that. Thanks. Thank Thanks very much. Gareth, I don't know if there's a final sort of summary oh, from you. Too much already. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right. Much, then, as always. <laughs> Yeah, I've just got a few thank yous just to Hanley and the, to the Millpark team for orchestrating this, to Gareth for facilitating the discussions. As always, thank you very much. You always set everybody at ease, as Re Regina said. A big thank you to both Renee and Regina. We really appreciate your input. And last but not least, thank you to everybody who joined the webinar today. Please, the recording will be available and reach out to us. And we'll see you at the next episode, episode two, um, loading. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a fantastic